All right, we are back again, Dr. D's Social Network, back with another solo cast. I'm enjoying doing these solo casts, particularly because I think um, I'm trying to take an angle of asking a big question. And when I post this information to really stir up a big conversation and let's provide some solutions to the conversation. Um, and today I want to start out with asking a big question that I think is certainly not a popular opinion or a p popular take, uh, but is one that I think we need to discuss. And I actually discussed this a little bit in my episode with Michael Piercy. Michael's awesome, incredible fitness professional, very experienced, just a good guy. And I talked a little bit about mental health with him uh, during the episode. Definitely check that episode out. Uh, so this ties into that. But let's ask this question. Are we over pathologizing mental health? Let me, let me say that again. Are we over pathologizing mental health? Now, disclaimer before jumping into that. This is not me saying that there are not mental health issues. There, I am a big believer in proper diagnosis of mental health issues. And I think we'd all do a good job if we would really take a hard look of what the diagnosis or diagnoses are related to mental health, according to the DSM-4 and all these different things and how we're actually really spending time, like what is a mental illness and what is just a difficulty? And life. So again, I'm all for uh, the proper diagnosis for mental health, mental illness, and we really need to be better with that. And we have a real crisis uh, with mental health professionals and helping people who are having some very serious issues related to mental health. But I think it's also fair to discuss, are we over pathologizing mental health and mental illness for things that are just part of being a human being. So sometimes I think we spend a lot of time over diagnosing or over or inflating uh, the seriousness of just difficult times in life. Sadness is sometimes just part of life. And some days you're going to have a shitty day. It doesn't mean that you have a mental health diagnosis or that things are going in a certain direction that are gonna lead you to that. Sadness, not feeling great, not feeling optimal. Uh, these are just part of living sometimes, but it's not always that these are um, crushing uh, or non-functional based things for you. And I think we're sometimes in my observation, it's just an observation, is that we've kind of over pathologized mental health that now that so many people are anxious or so many people uh, are depressed. It may not actually be, it just may be you're not having a good day. It may not be that you have a clinical diagnosis of depression. But on the other hand, you may. It depends. I'm not downplaying that that may not be, that that may be your situation. You may actually have a very a uh, difficult situation that, or a time in your life where you have significant depression, clinically diagnosed depression. I am a big supporter of getting help for that, whatever that may mean, uh, through different therapies, some medication. But this is not an issue for a gigantic portion of the population. So what I mean again is that going off this cliff of diagnosis because you're having a bad day or that... Uh, you're feeling anxious, all right? Again, there are some aspects of that where being overly anxious, and that is a pathology that can lead to a non-functioning state for people on a daily basis. I'm not talking about that. What I'm primarily talking about is the sense that over-pathologizing these conditions and saying that, that I must have that. That must be me. I must be depressed. I am extremely anxious. I... This is my diagnosis. When you just may be having a bad day, let's not confuse having a bad day with having a diagnosis of clinical depression, uh, having some psychosis, um, different things of that nature. And I think we, it's, we're in a time, and this what happens, and I talked about last time, and my last thing is kind of extremism. We never pull that pendulum to the middle 
We always pull that thing. We swing it like a roller coaster up really high, and it comes way back down. Our affinity for extremism is very tightly wound in the DNA of people. We have a difficult time being centered in our points of view. So uh, I think it's important, especially as those who are professionals in the mental health field, who had a lot of training and background, who understand and see this, and I've had many discussions with colleagues in this area, is that this may not be a popular take, but I think it's a sobering, very important take to say that not everything is a mental health issue. And sometimes you're literally, let me repeat this, sometimes you're just having a shitty day. Sometimes you're not having a great day. Dealing with hardship in life creates resiliency and hardiness, right? It doesn't mean that you're falling off of a cliff. Again, let me be clear because I know that there may people be people who are going to read this headline I put out when I post and they may immediately jump and go, Darian, that's how could you say that? That uh, there are people who are suffering with mental illness. I know this. I'm very aware of this already. But there's also people who actually don't listen to the show and actually listen to what I'm saying and that I'm looking at the spectrum of possibilities. Please listen before you comment and make a, an assumption about something you actually didn't listen to. I want to encourage people to do that. Listen to what I'm saying before just jumping into the conversation completely. It's called having a larger perspective, nuanced aspect. I have a lot of sympathy and I feel a lot of conviction for helping people that have gone through the diagnosis uh, practice or getting understanding that there's something very serious wrong, or seriously wrong. But this is not a huge, gigantic portion of the population uh, that everyone's anxious, everyone's depressed. Sometimes you're just having a bad day. And it's important that we don't overdiagnose for things that are just difficult parts of being alive. That's all I'm saying. I have bad days. You have bad days. We have difficult events in our life that push us and strain us and give us pause for not feeling great. A loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, uh, difficulty with relationships. These, these things are part of life. They also don't mean that you have a diagnosis of a mental health condition because of that. It also may be part of that, too. That's the other side. It also may be a triggering effect to cause something that is a chronic condition, potentially. Again, let me be clear. I am all for the diagnosis of that. You've gone through the steps, and this is what's happening uh, for that. But if you're just not feeling well, if you're just not feeling optimal, right, you've had some bad days, it does not mean that your mental health is in shambles. Part of this is part of the process of being alive is that there are going to be stressors that will stress you out and will also cause you to not feel great. And a lot of these stressors too also just build resilience and hardiness and buffer you and strengthen you for the trials that you're going to have in life. So it's a big question. Again, I can see both sides of the argument and that we may be over pathologizing mental health. But on the other hand, we do have a lot of things that are going on that are contributing to a lot of um, very serious chronic conditions mentally for people. And, and we need to pay attention to that. I'm all for our mental health professionals, things of that nature. But it, it wouldn't be right of me to just support that notion and not look at the spectrum of possibilities that we may be overdiagnosing people for mental health. And those things may just be the price of admission in life, going through difficult times here and there and building a reserve for that. All right, so we're going to move on to our next topic coming here. And it's going to be, and I think a big part of this conversation, what I'm doing with these solo casts is about the fitness industry. And I've been having some really interesting conversations about the fitness industry and professionalization. And one, I'm happy to announce I'm getting back into teaching and I'm in the afternoons and online in the uh, community college system, which I love community colleges. I think they're incredible resources and untapped areas for education. I think it's just a different monster. Um, it's certainly not financially crippling like it is in four-year institutions. And I think it could be an area, a gold mine for fitness professionalization and entry standards, uh, minimum criteria for the business, which is the one thing we're struggling with in our business is creating 
a universal entry standard or criteria for getting into fitness, health, and wellness. Right now, we have a, a very crazy certification system that certifies you with ACE here, ACSM here, NSCA here, NASM here, and so on and so forth. All these different words, these, th these three or four letter words, um, organizations that honestly the consumer literally has no clue who these organizations. I've been a trainer for over two decades now, and I guarantee you if I ask my clients who are these organizations, they have no clue who they are. I, I've been NSCA certified personal trainer since 2006. None of my clients know anything about the NSCA. And I would guarantee none of your clients know anything about the NSCA or ACE or ACS of anything. They don't understand the standards. They don't have that. And unfortunately, our industry has extremely poor reputation. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, and I do, but I just feel like I just need to say it. I think we need to be more honest about what's happening in our industry. We have a piss poor uh, reputation amongst the healthcare, amongst uh, allied healthcare professionals, and uh, we just don't have a lot of legitimacy. And uh, we're still in the very infancy stages of our profession. And so there's going to be a lot of mistakes in the infancy of anything. It's essentially fitness is a startup business as a whole. It's literally a startup business, the entire industry. It's so young as a formalized business, it could be considered a startup. A lot of mistakes happen when you have a startup for that. But we're teetering in a very interesting time because there's more options in this startup phase than ever. But um, the legitimacy of the business is, I would say, just as bad as it's ever been uh, for that. And it's going to take some big moves. And uh, again, I'll quote my uh, colleague, Michael Pierce, who I've had tremendous respect for. And we were in a meeting and he said, you know, we may have to hurt ourselves in order to change some things. We may have to hurt ourselves. I loved when he said that. And I talked to Michael about this publicly on, on my podcast with him. And I totally agree with that. And it's going to take different organizations in our industry to maybe potentially uh, sacrifice a little bit and hurt ourselves and really start changing the um, conference lineups, start changing the ideas of certification. Let's have a minimum entry standard. So this is what goes back into, I think, community colleges. Community colleges, to me, are incredible opportunities for a minimum entry standard for the fitness profession. Uh, and I was talking to a colleague of mine, Sherwood, about this on a uh, private message. And um, I really think this kind of a two-year institution, uh, kind of your career college model or community college model might be a great way to say, hey, if you do these two years at community college or career college, let's say community college, then you are allowed to sit for the ACSM exam, sit for the NSCA exam, sit for the ACE exam, whatever it may be. And it's not financially crippling, right? If you're going to a career college in your state, it's going to be extremely cheaper than going to a large four-year institution where, let's be honest, guys, for the first two years, you're going to take a lot of bullshit. You're going to take like Health 101. Uh, you're going to take a lot of basic level courses, just like I did, and I love the university that I went to. You're going to rehash a lot of high school stuff you did. You're going to take history courses. You're going to take English. You're going to do a lot of stuff that, again, let me say, it, these are good subjects. But honestly, it's kind of bullshit. You've already done it in high school. And uh, most people just want to skip into the job, the things they want to do to work in the profession they want to do. And let's skip that stuff. Honestly, you really don't need it. Um, the goal is to get a job, right, to make money to live, thrive in life. You need to have a good income, especially in the times we're living now. You need to be able to support yourself. And getting in the business right now, the current model of just weekend training, not a lot of um, educational background, is certainly not helping the legitimacy, legitimacy of our business. We need a better pathway, and that pathway needs to start with a minimum standard or minimum criteria for entry. And I'm lobbying for community college, two-year degrees, to be the minimum entry standard to sit for the exam for that. And that way, you can't just have one a hobbyist start in the profession and go, maybe I'll be a trainer this weekend. I've been a banker most of the time. Whatever, nothing against bankers. I'm just throwing that out. Maybe I'm doing insurance and I'll become a trainer on the side, right? That's, listen, 
it's wonderful you want to get in the business, but this is part of the problem with our business is that we've made the hobbyist a large part of our profession here, the hobbyist. It, we need to move away from being a hobbyist profession to a legitimate healthcare-based profession where we're respected by allied healthcare professionals, people like Michael Stack, a good colleague, talk about this, Rachel Pajednik, Amy Bantham, and so on and so forth, excellent advocates for this. We just did a presentation at ACSM about this, and the goal is to do more of these. We need to enlighten the industry to really focus on this and to spend more time on professionalizing, creating a minimum standard, and getting the respect that we should have and as part of the healthcare team. We're an important part of the healthcare team. But man, people do not look at us that way because we have a very joke of an entry standard. We have no standards, essentially. But big shout out to all the people working on that on a regular basis. I feel my part is to be kind of the communication head of that. I know a lot of people are working in the weeds on this. And, uh, you know, part of me going back to teaching, especially with students, is to help students get a better entry into our business. Because right now, a lot of students just don't want to be trainers. You know, they it's a joke to them. They they rather move into the uh, DPT programs um, either be exercise physiologists, again, great professions, um, because it's a steadier paycheck, right? It's difficult to be a trainer long-term. It's very difficult to have a steady paycheck and make it your business. The hours can be really rough. Um, I'm happy to say there's more options than that now, which I think is great, which is why I'm a huge proponent of, um, you making your money, whether through YouTube and the monetization through podcasts and stuff, do, do what you have to do to stay in the business, um, but stay in it. Work hard to try to be in as much as you can. I know everyone has different circumstances with family and things of that nature, but if we want to make this a better business, we have to have better, better minimum standards of entry. And I know for a fact, none of these certifications are going to consolidate and lose their money. People are not going to take less money for the better of the industry. It's just not going to happen. It will not happen. Money always gets involved and money always hurts things on the larger good of things. People are not willing to let go of it. But if we have a minimum standard of two-year degree from a community college or something like that, the certifications can continue to do their things, but then the certifications can get along and say, okay, you can't sit for this until you do that. Would that make the certifications lose some money because you can't just have anybody do it? Maybe. But we're, then we're not saying you need to consolidate. We're just saying you need to have a better entry standard. And I think community colleges are an excellent portion of that. And and by the way, you may live in a state where it may be free for you to go to community college. That happens in some states. Even so, if you're a resident in your state, you can prove your residency. It's usually very cheap to go to community college, very cheap. So it's a much better option for a profession like personal training where um, – I think you don't need to go to a four-year institution. I'm not bashing, bashing four-year institutions. I went to several myself. I'm very proud of my education. But honestly, there's a lot of garbage that courses you take for the first couple of years that have nothing to do with your life. I would have, honestly, I would have rather have taken those first two years uh, a lot more courses related to just being alive. And, and this is one thing that I think is important to talk about. And Rachel Pajednik and I have talked about just the importance uh, we need to spend those first, if we're going to have a four-year institution, and part of that is going into exercise science, health and human performance, spend those first two years making your students do therapy, do uh, basic counseling courses, resilience courses. Big shout out to Kylie Blodgett doing the resilience bodies courses at Norwich University. We need to spend time helping people meet themselves and spending time um, learning how to have better coping mechanisms and how to relate to other people. I just think it's it's crazy. Like a lot of trainers are like bring their messiness onto their clients. Like meet yourself first and spend that time working on yourself and continue to do that process while you're also um, working with people uh, for that. So, and I think even community college is two year program. I would be a big proponent. You can get most of the science based stuff done in, in a year. And then I think that first year, if your track is going into being a training to sit, needs to be primarily psychosocial-based courses for that. So this is a big rant, but honestly, I really think community college can be a great minimum standard. Uh, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile conversation.
All right, our last segment here uh, is generally uh, about kind of what's coming up here. Like I had mentioned before, I'm moving back into teaching. Um, I am not sacrificing any of my training for that. I'm a full-time trainer. I love being a trainer. Um, I embrace it. And, you know, I have my doctorate and I could be teaching full-time, but honestly, the personal training industry is a mess. I want to be on the ground level with it. And part of that, I feel responsibility to be training regularly and be a part of that and really be on the ground level and also teaching as well with that. So I'm excited to uh, be getting back into that here in Colorado and in Wyoming and uh, hopefully making a difference working with students who have a desire to be in the industry and to help um, pull up our industry. Uh, some more, tra I want to be very transparent in these solo casts, especially too. And I think one thing in podcasting is we don't talk about our numbers, right? We don't talk about our downloads. It's like a big no-no or something like that, unless you're a huge, huge podcast, right? And they're getting, you know, millions and millions of downloads every episode. I mean, that's mostly not most podcasts. You kind of have your elite level, huge monetization, Spotify, exclusive deal podcast, things of that nature. And then you're just most of us, the rest of us down there. Well, I'm happy to say Dr. D's social network has reached some new heights. Uh, not only do we have several amazing affiliates, we're bringing on a new affiliate coming on. We're actually making money. I can honestly say we're actually making money with the podcast, uh, especially with my layered superfood um, affiliate. It's it's maybe uh, some nice money. I'm very happy about that. Uh, a couple hundred dollars last month we did in layered superfood. Not a huge amount, but it's nice. Thank you for everyone supporting in that. Also, um, we're now doing 8,000 downloads a month, which is awesome, trending up towards 9,000. Would love for everyone to listen Let's keep pushing this a little bit higher. Let's show how a smaller podcast can keep getting bigger. And I also wanted to talk about one of the podcasts I really like to listen to is the uh, David Pakman podcast. It's more of a political-based podcast, but you know, independent uh, news podcasting about uh, politics. I like to stay up to date on things, but I certainly do not like the partisanship that happens um, and the fighting back and forth. It's just garbage. Um, it really is. So I like more of independent uh, journalism and news. And I mean, I wouldn't say this is super independent, not like uh, Crystal and Sagar, uh, which I think is much more of that. But I, what my point is that I like David Pakman's podcast, especially uh, because he's very transparent that with his podcast, not only is he trying to provide good quality content, but that he is trying to get subscribers. He is trying to make money. And I never mind when somebody tells me, hey, I'm trying to do this to increase the visibility of it and to make money and to also have a better product. I don't like when people try to be very virtuous about it and say, oh, it's not about the money. I'm not trying to do this for money. Listen, just tell the truth. And the truth about it is, here's my truth of why I podcast. A couple of things. One, I like talking to people. I enjoy talking to people. We're going to have more um, uh, interviews coming up really different episodes. People love that. I talk to so many different people. That's great. The other thing is I don't need it to make me money. I definitely don't I have a very full, rewarding personal training career and uh, another business I co-own and now I'm teaching. I don't need it to make money, but I would like it to make money. And uh, I don't want to be a uh, lie about that. I want to be open about it. I would like to, like it to make money and we are making money, which is great. It's very little, but it's more than what I would say a lot of the industry can say. And I want to push our downloads up. I want more people to listen to Dr. D's Social Network podcast. I think we have a great product here. Um, and the content is really solid. The guests are really solid. I'm loving how these solo casts are going. So let's push it up to 10,000 downloads a month. My host is Zencaster. Big shout out to Zencaster. They're really awesome. I'm really enjoying being on the platform. I know it's been glitchy for some people and they're frustrated with it, but I would say Zencaster has definitely improved over the years. I used to be with them about four years ago. They pulled me back in with a pretty great deal with my affiliates. I'm very happy with that. And uh, my audience has been much larger with that. So we're currently right, as I look at it, right around like 8,000 downloads, like 8.1 or so. Let's keep pushing that forward. Let's get to 10,000 downloads a month. I also am trying to grow my YouTube page. Again, I think YouTube's an awesome option for fitness professionals, another way to monetize. We're currently at 351 subscribers. I'd love you to subscribe. It literally 
You don't literally, it doesn't overwhelm you. You subscribe, it costs you nothing. It doesn't overwhelm you with notifications, things of that nature. It's not like crazy social media stuff. It's just like all over your life. Would love if you I went to my YouTube page, Dr. D Social Network, hit the subscribe button, subscribe for that. Let's get our watch hours up, trying to enter the YouTube monetization program. We're really trying to grow this podcast. I think it's a really important podcast. We're up to over 630 episodes. One thing you know is I'm consistent. I'm going to keep it consistent. And we're going to keep having an awesome show. We're going to keep evolving. We're going to keep having lots of guests, but we're going to keep this solo cast thing going. I'm so grateful. Still trying to work on some new series projects. As you know, my last project was For the Lust of God. Very well received. Uh, spent a year producing that. But uh, thank you for everyone listening. And uh, if you get a chance, again, subscribe to it on YouTube, Dr. D's Social Network. Listen to the podcast, share it with your friends. Uh, let's get it. Let's keep it going. Let's make a smaller podcast into a bigger podcast. I'm very proud of our 8,000 downloads. As it is, that's a lot more uh, than the industry standard for this size of podcast. But let's keep it going. And I really appreciate everyone. And listen, it's Friday here. This will come out on a different day, but it's Friday. Have a great Friday. I'm going to have an amazing Friday here in Colorado. Uh, spend some time with my family. Enjoy some movies. Never be ashamed of enjoying some Netflix. Hang out, binge a couple episodes, do whatever you want to do, whatever works for you that's positive in your life. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll talk to you next time.